Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church's virtual service for August 9th, 2020. I'm Pastor Brad Chamberlain. This is now our 21st week meeting together in heart and spirit over a shared YouTube video. And this Sunday marks my 50th week as a pastor here. I did the math and September 20th will mark the day that half of all of my life as clergy has been online. Things don't always develop according to our expectations, do they? We're entering into a series on the Beatitudes. That's the set of blessed be statements in Matthew 5. And we'll be looking at them in relationship to the 12 steps developed for addiction recovery. In both cases, these lists are looking at how the way to thrive in this life is an acknowledgement of our brokenness and through submitting entirely to a higher power and more specifically in our Christian faith to Jesus Christ. It is a relationship built on need, not on wants, and that need requires us to own our own limitations. And in both cases, the result of that submission is freedom. I plan to focus on this for a number of weeks and I'm dedicating this much time to it because I truly believe that in this current era of coronavirus and the exposure it has laid on systemic injustices in our country, it is each of our deepest calling right now to live Micah 6 8, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And really, all of our efforts towards the first two of those will fail again and again until we learn to walk humbly. And walking humbly is to admit our own powerlessness, to submit to Christ, and to walk in his power. And so in this week's service, we are looking at the first beatitude, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's correlate in the 12 steps. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over fill in the blank, alcohol, heroin, food, and we could extend it to other issues that we are powerless over, self-obsession, privilege, racism, etc. That our lives had become unmanageable. Given that poor in spirit, as we will see, does not mean lacking in spirit, courage, or religious awareness, but rather that poverty is not just a physical condition, but it's a spiritual one. Jesus is saying that we must be humble in our spirits. And why? Because we can't do it on our own. We need this humility. We are powerless over the impulses which control us. And so, step one of the 12 steps, we admitted we are powerless. As we move through the service today, consider if you believe this about yourself. Are you totally in control or are you powerless? What are issues or addictions or habits around which you find yourself to be powerless? What are the battles in your life that you are just so tired of losing again and again that deep down you know that you are powerless to change? This is where your need is, and this is where Jesus is waiting for you, ready to take your burdens and carry them for you as you walk together so that you can live a life not stuck in your own need, but being a blessing to others. As Proverbs 3.34 states, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And remember from last week, blessed be, does not mean that you're doing this so that all sorts of wonderful circumstances and stuff will be rained down on you from heaven. Blessing is, at its heart, an act of loving submission. One who lives their life acknowledging their poorness of spirit is walking in a way that is in accordance with God's desire for humanity. And like a loving parent, the very creator of the universe pours out adoration on those who are loving this way. God is intimately with us throughout this journey. Please join me in today's responsive call to worship. Sisters and brothers, we are gathered here to proclaim a power beyond ourselves. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in time of trouble. We know that we do not have the ability to save ourselves. We surrender our need for power and control 
and look toward the mystery and hope that is the kingdom of God. We acknowledge our need for God to work in our lives and transform us so that we may receive and share God's love and grace. Thanks be to God. Today's New Testament reading is from John, chapter 12, verses 23 to 26. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Let's read the prayer of confession together. God, as challenge and hardship breaks open the facade of my comfortable life, as the unforeseen dissolves the illusion of my vision of how things should be, as that which is shocking awakens me to the truth of how little ultimate control I have, as the certainty of uncertainty dissolves my self-delusion, as my perception of myself is shaken by the perception of others. May I come to you in faith, not for rescue from circumstance, but for strength to endure and the guidance to persevere, that I might come to know peace, the peace that passes all understanding, which is found in you as the Christ. This I plead and pray. Amen. Tithes and offerings may be sent by check, mailed to the address shown, 
or visit our church website and follow the Gifts and Tithes link. Let's pray. Creator, Sustainer God, our hope and our strength, thank you that you are God and there is no other. You are God and there is none like you. You love us with an eternal love and we give you our offerings as an expression of our love for you. We pray our gifts would be used to extend your love to others. May you, the God of all grace, who has called us into eternal glory by Christ Jesus, continue to walk with us, making us holy, strong, and filled with peace. To you be the glory and honor forever and ever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this week comes from Isaiah chapter 38, verses 9 through 20. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said, In the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? I said, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. No longer will I look on my fellow man or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night, you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion, he broke all my bones. Day and night, you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush. I moaned like a mourning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am being threatened. Lord, come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things people live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you as I am doing today. Parents tell their children about your faithfulness. The Lord will save me and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Let's get this series started today with the first of the Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Blessed be the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A simple enough statement, and certainly feels pretty good. But what does it mean, and what do I do with it? Why does it matter? This verse is made of two phrases, which are connected with the word for. Blessed be the poor in spirit, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The link, for, between these, has the first phrase as a result of the second phrase. Why are the poor in spirit blessed? Because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I think we often read this the other way around, that somehow the first statement causes the second, such as, you should be poor in spirit so that you will get into the kingdom of heaven. But that's not what it's saying. The having of the kingdom of heaven is not the result of poorness of spirit. Rather, the poorness of spirit is the result of having the kingdom of heaven. And what does it mean when it says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven? It means they are a citizen, they belong to, they are a part of that society. So putting this together, maybe we could restate it as, those who belong to the kingdom of heaven are marked by being poor in spirit, and God blesses them. We're closer to understanding this, but let's sort out these key terms, bless, poor in spirit, and kingdom of heaven. Regarding the word bless, refer to last week's sermon, August 2nd. But the gist is that the word translated as bless, as used by Jesus, was the Hebrew and Aramaic word barak, 
which has its, as its core meaning to kneel. So if God is blessing Barak, the individual, we have an incredibly intimate statement, which is like a parent who sacrifices and gives over everything to their child due to their adoring love of that child, kneeling before that child. The next key term, poor in spirit, is an odd combination of terms. It sounds like it means having some sort of weak spirit, which seems rather like something we don't want. The Greek word for poor here is tohos, to, sorry, let's try that again, tohos, which at its heart means one who crouches or cowers. And from that, it has meanings which extend to beggarly, poor, and humble. In this context, the meaning is more towards humble. The word for spirit in this verse is the typical word pneuma, which is used throughout the New Testament to mean wind, breath, and spirit, including both the Holy Spirit and also a human spirit. So maybe the easiest way forward is to just substitute in the word humble for poor to read humble in spirit. And what would it mean to be humble in spirit? It means to not be living for the ego. It means not relying on self, or as Paul puts it, not giving in to the flesh. It means acting in ways that acknowledge that we can't do this on our own. We need help. We are powerless over our lives and must live in submission to God, the ruler of the kingdom of heaven. And there it is, our third key term, kingdom of heaven. This is the concept of the spiritual realm over which our God our creator God reigns. The kingdom of heaven is both here and now, and it is eternal. God has always reigned, God reigns now, and God will forever reign. We are living within the kingdom of heaven now, and we will continue to spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven. So let's put these pieces together and create an explicated version of, version, of verse three. That is, a version in which all of the implicit ideas are made as explicit as possible. Those who have given themselves over to the spiritual realm where our Creator reigns are marked by their admission of their own powerlessness and their total reliance on God, who lavishes adoring love on them. <laughs> That's got a nice ring to it. Meanwhile, jumping forward a couple of millennia, in developing the 12-step program, William Wilson, known as Bill W., and Robert Smith, known as Dr. Bob, recognize that the core hinge of how we move out of addiction, which is very much the condition we are all in regarding living for our ego or our flesh, the core for moving away from this is in acknowledging our powerlessness. And so step one of the 12 steps is we admitted that we were powerless over blank alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. In the case of addiction, we cannot overcome the addiction through strength of will. Rather, we ourselves are powerless and need something stronger in our lives, God, a higher power, to lead us out of our addictive patterns. We acknowledge we are powerless. We have always been and now recognize our poverty of spirit. In the 12-step program, they talk about very practical measures for completing this step. I believe that admitting our powerlessness to overcome the sin and brokenness in our lives to overcome our ego and giving it over to God is the first necessary step and also an ongoing necessity in our Christian walk as well. So these measures written about addiction recovery ring very true for living in the faith in Christ as well. Here are the measures for how to complete step one. One, accept that something is wrong in your life and that you no longer have control. You must accept complete defeat before building a new life. Two, embrace the truth and want to make an honest change. Three, understand that recovery can't be done alone and acknowledge that you need help. Four, abandon pride and seek humility. Once you admit your problems and flaws, you'll find modesty and humbleness. You can't embrace powerlessness if you're still holding on to your pride. It's like an instruction manual on how to live out the first of the Beatitudes. How do we as Christians move towards sanctification and justification? How do we move further into alignment with the image of Christ? These steps are how, they are at the core. You can't embrace powerlessness 
if you're still holding on to your pride, it says. We cannot move into alignment with Christ or be gainful members of the kingdom of heaven if we are still holding on to our pride. Yet we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Ours is the kingdom of heaven. And we know that Christ is our strength. Christ is our strength to truly embrace our powerlessness. We can do this through Christ alone. Both of our Bible readings in today's service are about this issue. In John 12, 24, it says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted on the so in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels. This verse speaks directly to our pride, to our ego, to our Pauline flesh. Only in its death will fullness of life be produced. And in verse 26b, Jesus confirms God's blessing, God's adoration of those who live with this kind of humble spirit, saying, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Then in our Old Testament reading, we have Hezekiah, king of Judah, who has been very ill. He gets pretty dramatic in talking about how sick he was, starting in Isaiah 38.10. Here are some of his statements. Must I go through the gates of death? Will I be robbed of the rest of my years? I will never again see the Lord in the land of the living. I will no longer look upon my fellow people on this earth. My house, by which he means his physical body, has been pulled down and taken away. My life is like cut cloth from a loom and rolled up. It was like a lion breaking my bones. I cried like a swift or a thrush. I moaned like a dove. My eyes grew weak. I was at rock bottom, dead for sure. That's how sick I was. Then he goes on from lamenting his brokenness. And the turn, and the turn he does is based on his recognition of two things his own powerlessness, and that restoration is only through God. Nothing I could do would ever save me. I was powerless over the affliction. But you, Lord, restored me to health and let me live. And so I will walk humbly forever. This is how we people can be truly alive. And through walking humbly, my spirit finds life as well. You, God, lovingly saved me. The dead can't praise you, only the living can. And I will live my life knowing that you are in complete control, that I am powerless, that you are the only reason I have life. And for that, those of us who understand all of this, we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives. This is a song or a prayer of recognizing powerlessness humbly submitting to God's control and living a life of joy in that submission. It is, we admit we are powerless and it is, blessed are the poor in spirit. And it is hard. Acknowledging we are powerless is hard. It's the number one reason people feel, fail at the 12 steps. It's the number one reason we fail to go deeper in our faith as Christians. It's the number one reason we end up we end up serving ourselves instead of serving others. It's why we lean into our privilege and advantages for personal gain and not for the uplifting of others. We can't really get started because none of us want to let go of control. We won't let go of being in the driver's seat. We won't let go of pride. We refuse to surrender our freedom or our privilege without a fight. As Richard Rohr puts it in his book, Breathing Underwater, quote, Letting go is not in anybody's program for happiness. And yet all mature spirituality, in one sense or another, is about letting go and unlearning." End quote. The same sentiment is reflected in the poem, Apropos of Many Things, by W. H. Auden, who wrote, We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread then climb the cross of the present and let our illusions die. And so each of us presumably have issues we can't overcome. It may be societally, you know, it may be chemical addictions, it may be social or psychological addiction, addictions, 
Underneath it all, we are all addicts of our own self-interested, prideful egos. And the path of Christianity is really, in so many ways, the path of recovery from that addiction. I have my own struggles. You have yours. Lay them out to God. Admit your powerlessness. In these days of soul searching, which inevitably come from the circumstances of pandemic and increased exposure of systemic injustices, I find a whole new field of issues which I need to grow through and give to God, or more accurately, systems which serve me and are harmful to others, which I am in, a dis in essence addicted to. And through this, I am doing my part to perpetuate these injustices on others. So this same process can be useful for dealing with addictions, to dealing with our fallen broken souls, to moving us into a position of addressing issues which we know from our faith we should be addressing, but which we choose to avoid. They are all of a piece. They are all about serving our ego. How do I break out of this cycle? How do I get away from acting from the flesh, from the self-interest, from the self-interested prideful ego. I have to believe that the first step, even in this, is for me to admit that I am powerless. I can't fix this dilemma by my pure will, but God can. On my own, I will end up serving me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, admitting we are powerless. It means we acknowledge our own limits and give ourselves over to God's control to be used in his kingdom. If you have the chance, think through an issue or two in your own life, which deep down you know you are powerless over. Consider, as we work through the Beatitudes in the coming weeks, how you might walk your addiction through to ego through these steps, giving it all over to God, truly giving yourself over to God, and to truly understand that to live is death and to die is gain. Let's strive through Christ's strength and in Christ's grace and mercy to learn humility over ego, submission over self, and service over competition. Let's take this first very difficult step together. Let's pray together. Lord, we gather together in spirit, though at different times from one another and in different locations, we are nonetheless in fellowship with one another and have set aside this time solely for you. To offer you praise and worship, to hear you speak to us, and to be shaped a little bit more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So we come humbly and quietly before you, praying, Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, we thank you for those times this week where we smiled and laughed, those times of friendship enjoyed, those times when we appreciated the beauty of nature, when we felt a peace in our hearts, when we paused to be grateful for the life you have given us. For all of these and so much more, we know that we are blessed, and in gratitude and joy we pray. For our difficulty and struggle, for the times when we have been less than our best, we give you thanks that you do not turn away from us and that we are never left alone. We know that we can't make it all work on our own, and we lean into your love right now, sustainer God. And so we pause in silence to personally confess our weakness and sins to you now. Lord, we lift up our church community. May you keep us connected, healthy, relevant, even in these difficult times. May you help us to know when our own are hurting and to be ministers of your love to one another. May you strengthen each of us to be vessels filled with your love and power and able to be shining lights of your beauty to people around us. May our hearts be broken by the injustices and suffering in the world. And may you lead us each into understanding of how we can be ministers of justice and comfort to others. 
We lift up those who are sick, suffering, lonely, or just in need of your presence. We ask that you would reach out with your blessing, with your guidance, with your peace. Hear us now as we share the names of those for whom we ask your love, mercy, and peace. Lord, for the confidence and the joy and the hope we have because we walk daily with you, we give you thanks and praise in the name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With his spirit and his love Let him fill your heart And satisfy your soul Let him have the things that hold you And his spirit like a dove Will descend upon your life Make you whole, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, come and fill your lands, Jesus. Please receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And now, wash your hands, wear your mask, 
keep your distance, stay safe, act for justice, love mercy, and with each step, each day, walk humbly in submission to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bye. See you next week.